Yeah, hello. My name is Jörn Bjerre Jensen. I'm a professor of urology with a special focus on bladder cancer, uh, working at Aarhus University Hospital and at the Regional Hospital of West Jutland. I'm also chairman of the Danish Bladder Cancer Guideline Group and chairman of the Nordic Urothelial Research Cancer Group. Uh, I have a slight conflict of interest in the study as I'm part of the advisory board of CEPHIDE. So uh, my name is Morgan Rupré. I'm working in Paris, France. I'm a professor of urology in La Pitié Salpêtrière at Sorbonne University. And my uh, field of interest uh, is uh, the same, I would say, uh, cancer, of course, but especially bladder cancer. I'm a member of the guidelines, uh, EAU guidelines of bladder cancer. I'm leading the network of research in bladder cancer in France. And I'm currently the chairman of the European section of Oncourology of the EAU. Uh, this is the reason why I will try to raise some points after your presentation. And uh, we'll discuss further the, the the use, the potential use of the marker um, in the in the field of the muscle invasive bladder cancer. Thank you very much. Well, the study I'm going to talk about is uh, the Danish Bladder Cancer Group study number 15, also called the SEAL study: surveillance of high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer using the expert bladder cancer monitor. Um, the Expert Bladder Cancer Monitor is a commercially uh, available product from CEPHIDE in, in the USA. Uh, it's based on detection of mRNA fragments from three commonly known bladder cancer genes with an RT-PCR based method. Um, the easy thing about this is that you can do the test in-house and you do not need a difficult lab technology. You can basically do it as a urologist also and you have the test result within one and a half hour after delivery of the urine from the patient. Um, the clinical performance of the expert bladder cancer monitor has been investigated in other trials uh, with different outcome. But if we focus on the trials, um, where you can separate the high-grade tumors from the low-grade tumors. We can see, especially the study from Waldenberg, that uh, the negative predictive value was very high in, in that study, uh, which is why we chose to use this, um, this test instead of all the urinary markers when we wanted to set up a test or a study where we would show the clinical potential benefit of a urinary marker. It performs much better in high-grade uh, patients than it does in, in patients with low-grade tumors. And that's the reason why we have these variable results because the, the mixture of patients is variable. And the SEALS expert trial is a randomized clinical trial where the control arm is the standard follow-up in high-grade patients with cystoscopy and cytology, whereas in the intervention arm, we use the expert um, urinary test combined with cytology and only do uh, cystoscopy if one of those are positive and just for safety reason, anal uh, cystoscopy during this designed study. Uh, it's designed as a non-inferiority study, so we'll have to include uh, almost 400 patients where the primary outcome is no difference in recurrence-free survival between the two groups. It's a multi-center study here in Denmark where we're enrolling patients from Aarhus University Hospital and Sealand University Hospital and then the regional hospital of, of West Jutland. Uh, we include patients with previous high-grade uh, tumors, uh, including CAS uh, of the non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer patients. They have to be recurrence-free at the time we include them. Uh, whether or not they are undergoing BCG at the moment or previous BCG treatment is, is not an issue, but uh, we will be stratifying um, uh, according to this. Uh, if we have patients with um, invasive tumors, T1 tumors that have not undergone re-resection, we do not include them. If they have other urinary tract tumor, uh, we do not include them because we know this test can also be positive in other tract tumors. Um, and that's for the study reason, not so good to include these patients. Uh, we also know that some of these markers might be positive if you have other solid cancers. So we exclude patients with known cancer uh, of other organs. 
patients, including a randomized, as we said, in the, the control arm versus the intervention arm, where cystoscopy is only performed once per year in the two years that we follow the patients in the study. And then, of course, if either the, the uh, marker or the cytology is, is positive, we'll perform um, cystoscopy. The intervals between testing in the two arms is uh, identical. We initiated the trial with the first, first patient included in November uh, last year. Uh, currently, we have included almost 150 of the 400 patients, so we are including according to our plan. Despite uh, the COVID-19 situation, we have achieved to enroll patients. We had a slight problem at one of the hospitals where all the project staff was taken to the acute corona uh, department uh, for two months. So it was put asleep, the, the, the study at that uh, point. But um, anyway, we, we're uh, including according to plan. So we hope to finish the, within a year or so with inclusion. Um, at that time, we also have the, the uh, sufficient follow-up of the first 100 patients to see whether we should um, abandon the study preliminary if we have a worse outcome in the intervention arm. Um, here we have the, the, me as the sponsor investigator. We also have here a picture of the primary investigator, uh, Thomas Dyer, who is doing this as a PhD study. Uh, under my supervision. Uh, the sub-investigator from Zeeland University Hospital is uh, uh, Associate Professor Nissen Asabi. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, Jorgen, I would like to congratulate you for running this trial for the simple reason that I am sitting in the panel of the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines and I can tell you that when it comes each year to the discussion to expand the text around urinary marker, we always have a lack of evidence because there are no such trial with a randomized trial uh, comparing two arms and it is absolutely what is requested and needed to be incorporated in the guidelines. So uh, how uh, that's the most important thing because when you look at the regimen of surveillance of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer which is proposed by the guidelines right now it's much more eminence based than evidence based. So my point is that, of course, you had to choose in your study a design which was in line with what you expected to reach. But my point is, how do you see the regimen of surveillance, considering that your study is going um, to be, uh, let's say, positive, and that the regimen of surveillance and decrease the use of cystoscopy and cytology in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Because one of the issues that we have is cytology. We need to rely on a good pathologist. And as you mentioned, the test is the same all over the world, wherever it is done. So there is no restriction in using the test. So how do you see the regimen of surveillance according to your trial evolving? And how do you see the decrease of the use of cystoscopy? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, you could say the reason for doing this study is to, to show what the clinical benefit might be of a, of a urinary marker. And therefore, we, we do not want to just have it as a supplement to the cystoscopy. We wanted to see whether you can replace the, the cystoscopy. And uh, basically, if, if you look at the different regimens for patients with uh, low-grade tumors and high-grade tumors, the intervals is very much different. Uh, so we are hoping at having something so we can decrease the number of cystoscopies in high-grade patients. And if this study turns out positive, uh, you could say the next study will go on, could we skip the cystoscopy altogether? Um, but at least if it turns out that it's just as good as doing cystoscopy with these three to four months intervals, well, patients with, prim uh, with uh, high-grade tumors can at least skip most of the cystoscopies and only have the yearly cystoscopy uh, in the future and then have this urinary marker uh, in the intervals. And if you look at the problem the other way around, you spoke about high-grade bladder cancer because it's uh, what is at stake in our daily practice. These are the dangerous uh, tumor. 
But the other way around is the low-grade tumor where the regimen of surveillance is based only on cystoscopy. And, uh, and there is no cytology if you look at the guidelines. And uh, in this population also, it could be useful maybe to decrease or to do one year of cystoscopy and thereafter uh, for the subsequent surveillance to rely on a test. And I think that maybe also in this population, there is uh, something that we could do safely, I would say, because if you miss something in the high risk group, it, it could be dangerous. In the low risk, I don't know how you see it, but it's maybe there where people would be happy to change the practice quite rapidly. Yeah, I totally agree, because one of the reasons for doing the, the, the follow-up cystoscopy is, is obviously to, to look whether they have recurrence, but progression is also what you're looking for. Uh, it's not that common you have patients with low-grade tumors progressing to high-grade tumors, but you see them. So in that population, you might need to test a lot more patients with the test to, to find the high risk, but you probably find them with this. So, so you can also skip in the future uh, some of the, the follow-up in, in low-grade patients. Another question I would like to, to raise is the, the use in your daily practice, because we discussed about the trial, people are on roll, they are accept to do some research, but um, are they ready for prime time? And it is not only about the expert bladder test, because as you mentioned, you had to choose one test and you rely on the accuracy and the predictive value, but there are some other tests I'm sure you are aware in the pipeline. Uh, yeah. The company from Israel, the company from the uh, UK, and those, this company from the uh, United States of America. So, do you have any experience with the use of the, um, these tests uh, in your daily practice? And, uh, and if yes, what is, in your opinion, the patient benefits? Well, in a clinical practice, we haven't introduced any of them yet, but for a research projects, we have tested several of these. We're uh, currently also doing another study on the EBITCHEC marker. Uh, we're doing a third study on the Euromonitor, and we also have our, our own um, urinary marker through our Department of Molecular Medicine. But the, what you can say for all these tests is it's not that easy. Uh, the one from Israel has to be uh, processed a lot by our lab technicians and then sent to a, a, a German laboratory. A uh, urine monitor has to be sent to Portugal to be analyzed and we get the result within two weeks. Um, so, so you have to have a good test, but it also has to be logistically possible to do this. Um, I think this test, uh, we chose it because of, of the, the high sensitivity and, and the high negative predictive value. And afterwards, we also found out that it was a good test because we could do it in-house. You can get the test result while the patient is in the clinic if they just want to wait one and a half hour. And then you can do the cystoscopy without having the patients coming for, for the hospital um, at, at two visits. Thank you. Another point is the cost, because we are not talking about a very expensive drug, such as uh, uh, the budget that we have, for instance, immunotherapy uh, in, in the field of metastatic uh, bad cancer. But still, the test the, is more or less 100 euro, I believe, if you agree with this amount, I would say it's... Uh, is the, the, what I have in mind. And the question is, of course, if the test uh, is available, recommended by the guidelines ultimately, the reimbursement uh, yeah. is the issue. Uh, what would be the process uh, according to you? Um, which, uh, what are the next steps to get the, the, the reimbursement? Well, that's a very good point. And that's one of the reasons for setting the study up in, in this way and not having the urinary test as an add-on because here in Denmark coming up with an additional test that we think might be helpful in assisting, um, there'll just be an additional cost and it'll be very difficult to get that reimbursed. So that's why we, in this study, want to show whether we can replace this, uh, expensive cystoscopy with a uh, slightly less expensive uh, test and at least uh, if you include the the benefit for the patient and, and the pain and the risk of U UGI of the cystoscopy well then it's much better to have the urinary test if it's just as good and then the reimbursement will come from the money you save from the the, the flexible cystoscopy at least here in Denmark 
um, depending of course on how how many false positive tests you have if you have a lot of them you'll just add the cost of the additional cystoscopy but but uh, hopefully this uh, study will enlighten that also hey, one other point because um, i'm very supportive of the of this uh, uh, pathological entity it's called upper, upper urinary tract because uh, the eau yeah. is promoting uh, specific guidelines for upper tract tumors so we all know that they share some uh, uh, some uh, some similarities with bladder cancer, but the point is that it can be tricky sometimes to depict an upper tract tumor. And you mentioned that you excluded on purpose the patient uh, who were likely to have an upper tract. But uh, do you believe that there is room also for the use of this kind of test in the renal pelvis as a ureter tumor? Because we all know that there is also a carcinoma in situ in the upper tract. It's obviously underestimated. And this kind of test uh, with, um, I would say, a bladder reservoir, which is absolutely empty of tumor, it could be useful as well. What do you see? I think it might be also be excellent for, for upper tract tumors. Uh, I know that the, the preliminary results of, of a study focusing on that was presented at the virtual EAU meeting uh, this year. Um, the reason we're excluding them is because if we have patients with uh, previous uh, upper tract tumors, um, it would be very difficult to, to, to have the same flow in this more clean study. But I'll tell you about one patient case we had in, in our study who had continuously positive uh, tests, yet negative cytology and negative cystoscopy. So after two visits where he still had a positive uh, expert test, we did a CT urography and found an invasive upper tract tumor and, and he has now undergone nephroureterectomy. So because he was in an intervention arm, we found his upper tract tumors. We wouldn't have found it at this time in, in the control arm. So yeah, that one patient is, was, was lucky, I would say. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I think we need to close this discussion, but having a randomized trial in that field is particularly rare and we would be extremely happy uh, to have the publication and as soon as it is available to incorporate it in the guidelines, I believe, and it will be discussed in the panel. So I think it's the way to go and we, uh, we, we needed to highlight the work you have done in, the, in this field because it's so rare and it is absolutely mandatory to have such quality data. So thank you very much once again. And um, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll present extensively the results of the travel in an upcoming uh, uh, EAU presentation. Thank you. You can be sure of that. Thank you very much.